so as Justin mentioned, I do some operating systems work, and I do it in the context of the academic environment, and I also do it in the open source environment. So what I'll talk to you today is about taking some old ideas about security and trying to refresh them a little bit in a current context. And as I said, a little bit of that has been done this before already this morning, some thinking about capability systems, some thinking about moving code around inside systems, and of course, I have interests there as well. So those of you who don't follow the academic literature, in 1975, Saltzer and Schroeder at MIT published the first sort of really severe survey of computer security. And they drew a lot of boxes, and they had lines in them, and they talked about capabilities, they talked about files, although I think they called them segments, uh, and so on. And they introduced a bunch of words, like access control, passwords and audit and so on, uh, trade-offs. They even talked about human-computer interaction and passwords. So a lot of uh, what we would think of now as very timely ideas, uh, but in 1975. So a good question for us might be, um, what has changed since then that we're still using all the same words, and yet we seem not to use systems that actually contain them? So if we were to fast forward about 40 years, we find ourselves, eh, 2014. Um, and some good stuff has happened. So we have embedded and mobile devices that are these incredibly powerful things. They have these rather spiffy multi-core 64-bit ARM processors. It's all rather nice. And something funny happened because in 1975, uh, all of the users were running around trying to use the same computer. And now I can't help but notice that I'm carrying three or four different computers with me even just to trot down to London for a few hours. Uh, I think that's an improvement. Not entirely sure. Of course, we have ubiquitous internet access. This is not something that was common in 1975. Um, and we also have something rather neat, which is that a lot of our software platforms are now open source, and some of our hardware platforms are also starting to become open source. Some bad things happened. Uh, someone put money on the internet. And so many people consider this to be good, but it created some incentives for some bad things. Uh, we managed to globalize communication all over the world, but we kind of forgot to bring law enforcement and laws with us, which creates all kinds of opportunities, good and bad. And of course, we're still designing computers as though none of this happened at all. Right. And I think a, a telling thing is, in fact, that 40 years later, we're still really afraid of the idea of software liability. I am not in a hurry to have anyone sue me over my software. I put a disclaimer on everything I write. Why is that? Hmm. Well, that's good to think about. So things are not going well. So you remember in 2000, it was considered a cool prank if the entire internet was spread, you know, covered in a worm that told everyone that somebody loved their girlfriend. Uh, and today, the entire internet is covered with some really more exciting things. And organized crime got involved. That made things exciting. So you like to throw around lots of numbers. So Gartner says, oh, billions of dollars. So we ran our own numbers at the uh, Cambridge Computer Laboratory, and we came up with something that was almost a order of magnitude low, yet it was still a surprisingly big number. And of course, there is malware everywhere. So we did some things. Uh, I'm going to talk to you very briefly about three different things, but I'm going to briefly mention one thing first, and that is that in 2000, in the FreeBSD world, we were playing with virtualization schemes, and we came up with something called Jails, which is a lightweight OS-based virtualization scheme. It seems to have picked up rather nicely. We're very pleased to see the idea all over the place. Um, the reason I mention that is that in 2000, or in the late 1990s, we thought about security very differently. We thought about it a lot more like people did in 1975 than we do today. So I'll now tell you about three projects that we ran and some of the lessons that we learned. Uh, the most recent of those isn't just in operating systems. We now do computer architecture and operating systems side by side and see what happens. So the first of these is the MAC framework. This is FreeBSD's framework for extensible access control. It arrived in the system in the early 2000s, sort of 2001, 2002. But it really has its inception in some 1990s ideas. Some of you may recognize this book. This is the Orange Book. The Orange Book was a document released by the organization that did not exist, but we now think of as NSA. Um, they were interested in computer security, and they find themselves in a tricky situation because they want to both make it better and sometimes not so much. Um, and so they released this book on how they would want to evaluate systems. And they said, you have to have a lot of stuff in your operating system. And this was appealing to OS vendors because there's nothing an OS author likes more than to add stuff to their operating system. It is what keeps us out of trouble. So they said, gosh, you should have some access control. And we think there should be two kinds. There should be some discretionary stuff where users protect their own things. There should be mandatory stuff where system administrators lay down the law and say how it's going to work. Uh, this is appealing to OS developers who are very into that kind of oppressive regime kind of model. Um, they thought maybe some privilege decomposition. They thought you should, not everything should run with all the privilege. This is an idea that didn't really catch on, sadly. 
Uh, and they thought about security auditing, which is the recording of security relevant events. And these are all really good things to do. The last one is a topic that came up in the last talk a little bit, and I guess also the previous one, which is on assurance arguments. This is how do you build your system so you can argue that it's secure? Um, and that's a topic you'll probably hear a bit more about from Bernard later in the context of Cell 4. Uh, it is an interesting topic, but not one I spend all that much time thinking about. So what do we know about these trusted operating systems? That they were really hard to use, they were slow, no one could maintain them, and nobody wanted them. So that was, that was a bit upsetting, actually. So what happened? Uh, the US government said, we will only buy systems if you do this stuff. All the vendors ran around and did it, and they spent a lot of money. And then the US government said, actually, maybe, maybe we'll do it for next year. And um, that continued for several years until everyone got bored and went home. So some interesting thing happens as a result of that, though. You've got a security research community that cared a lot about access control. I'm a fan of access control. It probably has to do with that personality trait I hinted at earlier, where you really wish to oppress everyone else around you. Um, some neat things were done. So the research community said, you know, maybe multi-level security, a bit annoying, labels and everything, classified, confidential, really hard to deal with. Why don't we try some other stuff? So they played with things like type enforcement, and they played with something called low watermark mandatory access control which is kind of a taint-based security model for operating systems. And OS vendors, especially open source vendors, kind of looked at all this stuff and said, this is really neat, um, but I don't really want to support all these things. I, mean, I certainly don't want to implement them all myself, especially if you guys can't even decide what you want, because we remember what happened last time. Um, and that left OS vendors in an interesting situation, trying to decide what to do. So if we fast forward slightly, you'll see the world has changed a little bit. Suddenly, all these embedded devices, which in the 1990s kind of barely existed, but if they did, they were running not really operating systems at all. They were running bare metal applications. Suddenly they run general purpose operating systems. Right? They need processes, they need file systems, they need TCP IP stacks. Uh, I like that my phone has a TCP IP stack. I think it's very excited. One of the nice, the nice sort of early examples of this transition was Juniper's Junos operating system. Where they said, well, why don't we just take FreeBSD and we'll stick it in the control plane of the router? Because why not? We need all the stuff it's got and we could implement it ourselves, but we could also not implement it ourselves. And of course, the kind of tail end of that curve is all these things pushing down into phones with Android and iOS. I sort of forgotten that this was the case. Really announced in pretty much the same year. So they do arrive side by side. And all those vendors agree that security is kind of, sort of, important-ish, yeah. So if you remember back to the first iPhone, people forget. The first iPhone did not have apps, right? Today we think of apps as being synonymous with the concept of a sort of conventional mobile phone platform. Why didn't they have apps? Well, one of the reasons is there is a risk that these third-party applications could brick the phone. And if you are a mobile phone vendor, you are shipping Android or iOS or whatever, the last thing you want is to have one billion phones returned because some app was a little bit badly behaved. That thinking kind of evolves a bit, and you begin to ship things like apps on the iPhone when you begin to figure out how to do security on them. And then you begin to think after a little bit, eh, that's funny. It's not just bricking that's important. Maybe it's my user's data that is important. And there's some sort of evolution there. And it's actually quite interesting. If you look at vulnerabilities in iOS, uh, a lot of them aren't the ability to break out of the sandboxing model. They're the fact that the sandboxing model policy was slightly wrong. Right? That some piece of information is leaked to applications. Uh, the sandboxing platform is able to protect against that, but that wasn't the adversary model. The adversary model was, can someone break the phone, not can someone get the data out of the phone? And so you can gradually see the security policy converging on what we think of as sandboxing, but didn't, it didn't start out that way. So we have a ton of policies, and OS vendors, as I said, have to figure out what to do about it. Right, there is this SE Linux stuff, there are antivirus applications, there are all kinds of things. And where OS vendors end up is with frameworks for access control in their kernels. This is simultaneously very much the same as what people thought they would be in the 1970s and quite different. In the 1970s, they thought we should have something called reference monitors, small bits of software. They control access to everything in the system. They do it in one place. We can show that they're correct, all these nice, good words. The reason these systems become real is that in the 2000s, suddenly we have so many access control models, we don't know what to do, and we have to somehow to take that into account. So there is an idea which we call security localization. This is when you take your operating system, you stick it in a product, and somehow you have to localize it or adapt it to the requirements of that specific product. So the Mac framework in FreeBSD is something that does that. So the idea here is that, like file systems, like device drivers, access control is something that you naturally extend about an operating system. Right? You're going to turn up to your operating system, you're going to build your product, maybe you add a file system, maybe you add a device driver, maybe you add a security model. Not such a complex concept. <laughs> 
So DARPA in the early 2000s was very interested in this, and you can see two widespread outputs from the DARPA Chats Research Program that both kind of target this problem. So Linux security modules, LSM, uh, and also the Mac framework and FreeBSD, and really conceived about the same time, and in fact done at opposite ends of the same corridor at McAfee Research. So I was sitting at one end, and Stephen Smalley was sitting at the other, and we were starting to talk about these problems and figure out what should we do, how should we solve them. So today, these frameworks are used for all kinds of things, and the FreeBSD Mac framework is used in Junos, it's used in Mac OS X, it's used in iOS, it's used in McAfee's own products, although the route to its own products is a little obscure. To get it into McAfee's products, we had to open source the results. The competing company had to start using it, and then McAfee had to acquire the competing company, because that is how technology transition works. It's really, it's really quite pretty. And we did anticipate some things that were actually needed. So for example, we said often systems need more than one security policy. Wouldn't it be a good idea if the framework helped us with that problem? Interestingly, that is not something that Linux security modules do very well. There, there is the idea that you have one master module and then maybe you know, it can call other modules. In the Mac framework, we went for a very explicit composition model because we know that people like to do integrity and confidentiality and maybe some other rules on the side. So we have a paper on that on Communications with the ACM, which is kind of interesting, of course, is Communications with the ACM is the venue in which Saltz and Schroeder published their own 1975 paper. We use a lot of the same words. We sometimes use them very differently. I said we'd have boxes. Here are some boxes. So this is the architecture of the framework. How does this work? Well, obviously, the kernel is the most important thing. So it's the really big box, right? And then there are some other things on the other side of the system core interface. I'm not really familiar with these things, but I'm told they're applications. The applications call into the kernel via the system call interface, and then they talk to kernel subsystems. So there have been a lot of different ways to arrange these boxes. So a popular way in the 1990s, a way that I do not recommend, is something called system call interposition. In system call interposition, you insert a box right in here somewhere in the system call interface, and you filter all the system calls coming into the kernel. And you say, oh, is this file allowed to be accessed? Are you allowed to connect using the socket? Seemed like such a great idea until we invented concurrency. Actually, concurrency existed already, and the idea never worked. The problem, of course, is that these kernel subsystems are accessing user memory, they're performing all kinds of operations, and it's really hard to make these things atomic with something here, because inside the kernel we have all these locks everywhere, and even if we had only one lock, we would still have this problem. Um, so we end up putting our boxes, as you have to put boxes places, down here instead, every kernel subsystem talks to a framework, an object-oriented framework that allows it to distribute requests for access control and labeling and other security kinds of things to a bunch of pluggable things, because of course, operating system people like pluggable things, so we have to have pluggable things in the picture. So requests trickle down from user processes, they go to the kernel subsystems, the kernel subsystems consult the framework. This allows those access control requests to be done with the right locks held. So if you're here in these middle boxes, you can hold locks over calls to the access control framework, which means you can have atomicity between time of check and time of use, which system call wrappers did very badly. So some design principles. One of our design principles was you really shouldn't commit too early to a specific access control policy. Why would we think that? Well, I just told you there are dozens of the things, and we can't decide as OS vendors which are the ones that we should give our users. Well, we can, but inevitably the users want something else. Another goal was to really prevent policies from leaking into the kernel, which is to say, don't extend kernel data structures with things that are specific to a certain policy. Doesn't seem like such a bad idea. This is encapsulation from the object orientation world. We provide a bunch of services to policies that run on the kernel. One of those services, something called a label, the ability to tag metadata onto arbitrary objects, whether they're files or processes, whatever they are. The Mac framework, as it turns out, allows every policy that's registered to maintain its own labels. They can be persistent. They can hang around just for the lifetime of the object in the kernel. Uh, and it turns out there's a lot of work required to make that efficient, so file systems have to be extended and so on. We support multiple policies at once, which I mentioned. Um, and then we try to impose some structures that make assurance easier. Um, in the previous talk, we heard about 100 million lines of code is a few too many to prove correct. Uh, I think you'd have trouble proving tens of thousands of lines of code correct. Maybe Bernard will mention that as well. Um, so what we try to do is create structures that make it easier to reason about it at a high level, if not to prove it correct. So ideas like a reference monitor from the 1970s. And of course, we, unlike a number of the previous systems, did design for concurrency. And this turned out to be very important because although our phones didn't have you know, modern operating systems on them at all 15 years ago, today they're multi-core. And we have to think quite hard about that. So I'll flip through some more boxes because it'll break up the text. So policy composition. Um, the idea that multiple policies are somehow contributing to the decision. Uh, we compose the results somehow. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we take a very simple composition policy. We simply say, if policies disagree, the most restrictive one wins. 
why is this a good idea? Well, it's obviously not what you always want. You might have a privilege policy that says, ooh, sometimes the other policy said no, but I say yes. Why do we disallow that? We disallow it because it's very hard to reason about. You can reason about all the policies in isolation if they have a very fixed, easy to understand composition. It's not that other things aren't useful, it just happens that this is actually quite useful uh, in practice. And although we plan to have a pluggable, composable, amazing, programmable meta policy, we never needed it, so we just didn't do it. I mentioned we have label abstractions, lots of boxes and lines. Uh, over on the left-hand side, we have some kernel data structures. So they're things like processes, credentials, and so on. Uh, and sometimes processes do things like create other objects, like sockets. And of course, what we've done is hung label structures off of almost everything. And these are extensible structures that can reference policy-specific data. And so when the kernel goes ahead and you know, perhaps creates a socket as a result of the socket system call, the Mac framework allows policies to interpose on that event and extend their own metadata for the new object. It's like a natural structure. Um, but it's a structure that didn't exist in kernels before, because before kernels had these very fixed functions, it wasn't really necessary to extend all of these things dynamically, and we really require that. I thought I'd say a couple of words about the development timeline. So these things take a while. So we started this project in 2000. It's now hmm, 2014. And yes, it is in use on, I don't know, uh, almost a billion devices, maybe over a billion devices, which is great. But how did the story go? Well, we decided that open source is really our preferred way to transition technologies, that if we just gave it away, that was probably better for everyone. And I think that is a good story for security, because we could all use a little bit more of it. So for the first half of the project, roughly, this work was sponsored by DARPA in the US, and uh, the US Navy, and so on. Um, Money turned up for all kinds of reasons. Oh, well, we're not sure about this type enforcement thing. We've been trying it out in these microkernels. We thought we might try it in Linux and BSD and see what happens. Uh, in other cases, it was, uh, you know, we're trying to get access to very specific policies in very specific environments. Can you help us? Right. Second half of the project turns up, and this is really, this is a, the left hand here is really a small development team, five or 10 people working in a research lab in Maryland. Um, the right-hand side of this is actually much wider, right? This is the bit where the open source community turns up and says, a great idea, but we should talk about this. Uh, maybe you should think more about performance, for example. Uh, and almost all the work on the right-hand side happens uh, once these companies are involved. So Apple, Securus, McAfee, the bits that do actual business, not just the bits that do research that you can lay off. Um, they all do interesting things. Uh, and of course, you know, academic researchers get involved too. So I get to wear that hat and say things like, how can we show this thing is more correct than we thought? How do we find bugs in it? Uh, how do we analyze its behavior? On the transition side, it is funny how many companies like things that are labeled experimental in italics. Right? Uh, so we declared that the Mac framework was ready for people to use here in 2010. Right? And we started the project in about 2000, so 10 years. The first product ships on the thing, I don't know, sort of probably here-ish in 2007. And in fact, uh, Apple manages to ship their first product before the FreeBSD product project is actually using the Mac framework in production, which we thought was kind of exciting. Turned out that product was the iPhone. So talk a bit about policies. We thought, why don't we come up with a bunch of policies we want to use in the framework? Yes, the font is intentionally too small for you to read. Um, over here, left-hand side, policy names. Right-hand side, working across our properties of the policy. So one of the things we thought was, if we have a bunch of different policies, even if they're not the ones everyone wants to use, we make them all work, chances are future policies will work too. And you know, I guess we were right. So we said all of our policies should work with the framework, and at the end, they all did. It was much more interesting when the rest of the world turned up and they wanted their policies to work. So Mac OS X, iOS, Junos, McAfee's products, another company called NCircle, we have some more. Um, so here are the things we anticipated, and there's another column on the end. So these are things, by the way, like file system access control, the ability to intervene in process life cycles, uh, the ability to control network access in various ways. The thing over on the right-hand side is kind of interesting. So we took a perspective that this was an access control framework, uh, that you had users and you had objects. This is a very classic way to think about access control. Turns out, the world thought differently. The important thing is actually the binary. The important thing is the application author. When you pick up your phone today and you download 40 applications, no one is saying which user is which. They're saying which application author is which, because you are the sole user of the phone, but now your use of the system is mediated in some ways by this application. So we want to control what the application can do. This means you have to link all of these things to digital signatures and certificates. Completely not in our minds when we designed the system. And yet it turns out that all of the different frameworks, the different policies we have here, you know, over half of them ended up caring about applications as a first-class citizen. These were the principles that we wanted to deal with. 
And if you rewind to uh, Saltz and Schroeder, yeah, there's no mention of this stuff, right? The world really has changed substantially. The ideas were portable, but they didn't really work unless we adapted them to the current world. I said, the world has changed. Applications are really the focus. So at the end of the project, you have quite different principles than at the beginning of the project. So, you know, I said, oh, you should really care about performance. You should really care about performance. So it turns out that policy authors not only want it to be fast in an absolute sense, they want to be able to select their own trade-offs in terms of performance and security. They may or may not want labels. They may or may not want various other features. And if they don't want them, they shouldn't pay for them. It seems like a straightforward conclusion. And yet, you know, it takes you 10 years to figure that one out. Another one is actually quite interesting. It's traceability. So it turns out it is really hard to debug security. If you break something, maybe you'd break it, and at the very bottom level of the system, nothing appears to change. Yet, you know, half an hour later, it turns out, you weren't able to load uh, your localization and internationalization libraries, so you couldn't get to the French language version of the error message. And so to half an hour later, when the error finally propagates to the user via log, it's in the wrong language, right? And it turns out all of our systems quite silently fail stop, you know, fail, well, they fail run, rather. They ignore the error, and they just provide the error in English. So that's, that's great. It works for me. Um, but it turns out it's really hard to debug. So you need to really design systems around debuggability, which became one of the guiding goals of the system. So we integrated Dtrace, which allows us to easily monitor all these events. Another thing as researchers it's easy to overlook is uh, programming and binary interface stability. It turns out this is really important. If people are going to be running their software for 20 years, if you were Apple, for example, and you want the program from Mac OS 9 to still run this year, which I guess you probably barely want at this point, but you did want for a long time, you really have to think about this stuff. And this is something that researchers and, for that matter, open source people have proven a bit mixed at doing. Another interesting lesson, turns out many people don't want their own entirely from scratch policy. They want to augment the policy that already exists, and that means that they want to modify certain existing behaviors, like the behavior of privilege, so the super user, they want them to behave differently now. Um, that wasn't something in our original design, it's something we picked up as we went along. And then I mentioned already, application authors are first class principles, which means they are the subjects in the system as much as the actual end user. Final point, and I'm going to touch on this for a couple of minutes, has to do with applications that themselves need security features. So the 1975 view was the operating system and then, you know, mid-1980s and the database uh, are really the center of the universe for security. But it turns out they're not entirely the center of the universe of security. It sort of pains me as an operating system guy to tell you that applications are important, um, but it turns out that they are. Let's touch on one or two more ideas. Um, Domain-specific policies. So we are promoters of the idea that you have different policy models in different environments because, of course, we couldn't commit to one. It seems kind of naive to think that there'll be anything else, in fact, now that we look at it, because the different models do very different things. So if you do information flow models, they're quite different from privilege models or capability models or whatever you may pick. And authors and environments need different trade-offs. They need different things. Let me talk to you a little briefly about another project that we've done on the application front. So we live, I guess, in a world that's quite different from the 1975. If you look at the 1975 paper, they're very concerned with what users can access and who authorized them to do that. Today, a lot of our access control is used for something quite different. It's used for something called compartmentalization or vulnerability mitigation. The idea is the application is going to fail open because it likes to run code that's sent to it over sockets. Um, and as a result of it, your attacker is now running with all the rights of the application. So we're going to use access control uh, to control the behavior of the application author, or rather the person who has rooted the application, uh, and prevent them from getting access to resources they shouldn't have access to. Um, this is a form of vulnerability mitigation. It doesn't try and interfere with the exploit, which is what uh, Stack Canary does, right? It accepts the exploit works. Um, where might the exploit come from? Well, it could come with the software you downloaded. So it is important that it constrain a very strong attacker model. So there is an asymmetry you'll probably have noticed, and that is that attackers always win, which is to say they have to find just one mistake, and the defender really has to make no mistakes at all, which leads to an enormous burden for defenders that we'd like to, to move beyond if we can. So how can we break that? Well, um, really, the two things we can do are improve correctness, um, or we can actually design for vulnerabilities. So my interests lie primarily in the latter category. And as an OS person, I, of course, declare the OS is useful for solving this problem. So, Application TCBs. TCB is a trusted computing base. Right? Historically, as I said, operating systems and databases. But now, your mail reader and your web browser, this shouldn't be encouraging. If you thought your OS kernel was a little bit buggy at times and crashed once in a while, you should see the web browser. Um, OS authors have been for a while applying a technique called privilege separation to OS binaries. So they've been breaking things into parts. And what we're going to try and do as an OS author is support them doing that better. You've heard a bit about capabilities thus far, so I won't hammer at home too much, but suffice to say, this machine sits down the corridor for me, 
uh, also from the 1970s, 1977, turns out this project ended the year that I was born. Um, so the CAP computer is a capability system in sort of 1970 style. The hardware supports the security model used uh, at the application level directly. It is an idea that interests us still, as I'll mention in a couple of moments. Right. We have these unforgeable tokens or capabilities. We have processes that are only allowed to access things that have been delegated to them using these tokens. So we can set up these structures, as we saw in the last talk, of applications and components all linked together in a graph. And we can pass these rights around and somehow we're gonna make it align with security. Um, we decided, well, this is a really good model. We should try dropping it into FreeBSD. So in the past, lots of people had done microkernels and they ran bits of BSD you know, on top of it and so on. What we want to do is actually atom smash them directly, provide a capability mechanism to the application running on Unix. So in 2007, Cambridge and Google got together and said, let's do this thing. And by about 2010, we had done that thing, which is to say we'd managed to hybridize the capability model and the Unix model. Uh, these are application APIs. They're intended for application authors rather than, although obviously you're welcome to use them, the OS author. So we shipped it in FreeBSD 9. It was experimental. People started using it. Uh, we decided we better call it production a little bit more quickly this time. So by FreeBSD 10, which I guess shipped maybe very early this year, it's a production feature. It is used by all kinds of stuff. So you run TCP dump. Yes, it runs as root. But yes, it also runs using the compartmentalization model, as do many of the other daemons. And we are trying to push out as fast as we can. And of course, you need infrastructure for these things. Among other things, we have something called Casper, which is a framework for providing rights to applications that need them, uh, maybe in response to a power box, which is, a, I think, a, a principle that we saw in the last talk but wasn't mentioned by name. This is things like, you have a file open dialog. The file open dialog has all the rights of the user. The application does not have all the rights of the user, so when you click on the file in the file dialog, the right to do that is transferred to the application to open the file, and we do this using the capability model. I was quite pleased Google has uh, done a Linux adaptation of Capsicum. They are posting patches for it on Linux kernel. We obviously watch with great interest. It would certainly be an easier argument to application authors uh, that they should adapt their applications if it is a more widely available API. And of course, the FreeBSD Foundation and Google are continuing to fund the project. I've mentioned some of these principles, but I just want to mention one or two. One of the ideas is that uh, a capability system is that applications really have access only to the resources they've been delegated. So Unix doesn't really work that way. Applications can name almost anything in the system, but sometimes the access control model says no. Um, we're going to break the world into two parts. We're going to say some bits are very Unix facing. They get access to everything they can name, and other bits are a bit more capability facing. They can have access only to the capabilities they've been delegated. And what we're going to do is call file descriptors capabilities. So we're going to modify the abstraction a little bit, but reuse them in that sense. We did some other things, like we extended the runtime linker. It turns out your application now has many processes. What is responsible for linking parts of an application? The runtime linker. So let's use the runtime linker to do that. And we're also going to do things like library compartmentalization, which allows us to say that a library itself contains sandboxes, even though the containing application has no idea that this is the case. And I mentioned Casper already. We sort of covered the compartmentalization idea, but maybe I'll sort of rehash it slightly. Fairly straightforward, you have one box before. For those of you who do microkernels, this will sound very familiar. One box before contains my vulnerable application and maybe gzip. Gzip is going to access some files in its main loop, and then it's going to run, uh, I don't know, exploit execution code, uh, compression or decompression. And in the new world order, we break these into parts. A bit looks like Unix, uh, and then a bit lives in this capability world. And the principle, of course, is that if they exploit this thing, they get only the specifically delegated rights. So they have some access to my system, but they have an eensy bit less. And of course, this is the principle of least privilege from Salsa and Schroeder. So, skip ahead there. Um, we had to think a little bit about how you would evaluate this idea, uh, wrap up in a moment. Um, how do you know if you've got the right API for security? Uh, the answer, I think, is in lines of code. Right? So, when we did this evaluation, it was about four years ago, we've since influenced substantially the state of the art. But one of the concerns was, for example, is discretionary access controls used in Windows a good way to do sandboxing? Uh, our answer was that 22,000 lines of code simply to support sandboxing, including quite a lot of assembly code, that is a bad way to do it. Uh, at the time, Linux's setcomp model, which is actually basically a capability system model, required 11,000 lines of code, of which you know, several thousand lines were assembly. Um, and also, they were incorrect assembly, it turned out, which was slightly, I mean, it was correct, it did what it said, but it didn't probably do what you want, which is, although they prevented access to the file system, they immediately delegated access to the file system to the thing running in the sandbox, because it was quite hard to do anything else. Um, these days, we have a new version of setcomp in Linux that has picked up some of the ideas from Capscom to do with limiting system calls and so on. So this is now used in Chromium on Linux, which is quite a nice improvement. 
Um, of course, some tools are the wrong tool for the job. They simply don't restrict what you want. So for example, the Windows access control model actually, you know, it helped you a bit with the file system, it helped you a bit with inter-process communication, it helped you not at all with networking. Uh, and I want to draw your attention to this little s not equal s prime here. Um, when we break things into parts, we don't just want different pieces of code running in different sandboxes. We want different instances of data running in different sandboxes. If you visit the same, you know, a different set of websites, you know, four different websites, those should not be in the same sandbox. And the model that they use on Windows place them in the same sandbox. If you have a single user computer, everything is in the web browser. It doesn't really matter if you root the computer. It only matters if you root the web browser. So you really don't want things going back and forth between your Gmail and your online banking. Another thing that was kind of interesting, SE Linux, it turns out, the policy there, 200 lines at the time, it seemed to do a lot of the things right. It didn't help us with this conflating sandboxes issue. It also required privilege to change the policy on the system. So something we really needed was the ability for applications uh, to change the policy themselves, to have application-driven policy. Uh, these days, the SE Linux policy has been removed from Chromium on the grounds that it didn't really do what they want. So even though the lines of code were small, we didn't quite get what we want. Draw your attention to two last things, and that is, of course, this privilege requirement. Um, one thing we got quite right, I think, in our work on the, on the uh, OS X kind of sandboxy environment is, as it went for mandatory access control, it was quite a nice model, but it wasn't really an application-driven model. It's being used that way in Mac OS X um, semi-successfully, I think. I mean, for example, Mac OS X, you know, this system here has power boxes. When you open an app, download it on the App Store, and a dialog comes up, and you click on a file, and you click open, the right to access the file is delegated to the sandbox application. So it's a very successful model, but it's a sticky match between something that is not really capability-based and a very capability-based model. Of course, at the time, and this remains the case, we always pick our evaluation table so that we get only checkboxes. <laughs> so. Okay. I'm going to hand my wave at just one last thing, uh, and that's just to show you a picture here. Um, compartmentalization is pretty neat. I've suggested you just break things up into pieces. It'll be great. Um, that's true. Uh, but it turns out there are lots of different ways to break things up. They have different trade-offs, <coughs> performance, uh, security, complexity, and so on. It's not, you know, simple at all. It's, you know, you're breaking your application up into objects and classes and so on. It's a messy business. And one of the things we found is that current hardware does this very badly. So a project that we've been working on on the research side for the past few years has been to develop hardware that does this kind of sandboxing much more efficiently. So I will just skip forward to the pictures because we all like pictures. Um, so we've developed an open source hardware software platform using FPGA-based soft core processes where we are experimenting with new models. Um, so we've built ourselves a processor that does the 64-bit MIPS ISA, about 1992 vintage, but it runs your current software, which is nice, it runs a little bit slowly. Uh, and then we've, what we've done is extend it so that we can do user-space sandboxing with very little OS intervention. So as an OS guy, why would I like this? Well, Philosophically, the operating system is the thing that is uh, maybe, I was going to say in charge, but I think possibly has this slight control complex, right? Systems programming is wherever you put it. It is okay for operating systems to be in user space as long as they're in charge, would be my take. Um, and so this is a topic worthy of operating system research in the sense that we as systems programmers would like to push our code into user space. It doesn't make it not an operating system just because it lives there. The people who do rump kernels and so on, this is still operating system research or operating system developments. So that's fine. Wrap up. A few interesting questions to leave you with on experimental processes. You know, what does it mean to add sandboxing inside of a user process? The Unix process model is really not about that. Right? It's about a Unix process has the rights of maybe one uh, user at a time. I mean, maybe you can multiplex it and switch back and forth, but then you've kind of mixed up all their rights. It's a very messy issue. Um, what happens if the kernel cannot trust that the user and the user process is behaving the way that, that user, the user process itself would prefer? Right. Could we delegate, could we you know, have sandbox code in user space? Could you delegate some system calls to the thing in the sandbox, but not all of them? These are quite hard questions to answer. Um, particularly tricky one for the OS is, you're going to deliver a signal because the thing in user space did something bad, and you can't trust the stack you're going to deliver the signal on. If you're into signals and stacks, and you sort of scratch your head for a bit. We have some answers, but it's, uh, it's messy. I guess the last observation is, you know, uh, can we make this even you know, debuggable at all, let alone easy to debug? I think the answer is actually is easier to debug than compartmentalize programs using IPC because you get actual stack traces. Um, we spent several years building this thing. Uh, we have now released it as open source as of this summer, begun to publish papers. It's actually possible, which is kind of neat. Um, you can actually go download the design, try it out on an FPGA. Uh, we're about to start shipping images for Altera's, oh, sorry, Teresic's socket card, which is an FPGA with an ARM processor on a couple of hundred dollar board. Download the processor, log into the ARM, connect to the uh, sort of MIPS-derived Cherry processor, and log into the OS instance there and run programs. So it's actually something you could do eh, probably at home. So, uh, Last thought. You know, 
the OS's role is changing, right? We're moving all these boxes around. Uh, the world's becoming more interesting. That's nice, I guess. Um, we are doing a lot of this stuff by blurring traditional boundaries. We're trying to get more involved in the structure of applications. We're trying to solve more interesting problems. We're trying to get more involved in the structure of processes. Um, Salt and Schroeder, a good read if you've not read it. They use words differently, but the ideas are pretty, pretty influential. And then, of course, you have to do the book pitch at the end. Uh, we have a new version of the design implementation of FreeBSD operating system, the second edition, uh, and you're welcome to uh, purchase it from Amazon. It does talk about both the Mac framework and the Caps framework. It does not talk about the Cherry processor, maybe the third edition, if we can do some technology transition. So thank you very much. I'm sure I've left myself no time for questions.